have a, a rather good panel put together, and thank you all very much for uh, attending today. Uh, we are very pleased to be joined by the Minister for Finance, uh, Michael Noonan. A uh, very busy job at the best of times, but I gather today there may be something happening uh, in another part of town as well that may distract him, or maybe not. We also have uh, Michel Servaux from the European Commission. Uh, we have Rowena Dwyer from the uh, IFA and Paul Ginell from the European Anti-Poverty uh, Network. And I guess what we're going to be talking about today, and uh, we're a few minutes later starting, which is good because that means uh, I can get away with speaking for a few minutes less by way of introduction. I guess what we're going to be talking about is the idea of inclusive growth within these um, country-specific recommendations. We've become used to the recommendations telling us to get on with uh, sorting out our fiscal affairs, get on with trying to grow the economy, but perhaps uh, we haven't placed enough emphasis on inclusive growth and dealing with issues on the social side <coughs> that contribute both to uh, welfare amongst individuals, uh, but also to longer-term economic growth. And we'll be thinking there are things like uh, the cost of childcare uh, within the country and the provision of childcare, and also the work intensity uh, in households where uh, we do have problems, we know about those problems, and now we have the European Commission uh, pointing the finger at us and saying, yes, you do have problems and we are watching you and how you deal with those problems. So those are things that perhaps we should be paying more attention to and including it more in the kind of discussions we have about uh, the management of the economy uh, in general. So that's enough from me. Uh, more importantly, we should hear from our uh, guests. Uh, and I'd like to call first on the Minister for Finance, Michael Noonan, TD, to take the floor and address us, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, fellow speakers, and all the guests here today. I'd like to thank the Institute for inviting me here today. The first significant speech I made when I was made Minister for Finance back in 2011 was to this Institute at the invitation of Brendan Halligan. And that day we set out our difficulties and our approach to the Troika, who were well, in, uh, well embedded in the, in, in the town and in our affairs at that stage. And I think it's a, a fortunate coincidence that this will be my last significant speech as uh, Minister for Finance. So we're rounding off where we started. But things have changed, thank God. So you'll indulge me if I wander a bit and ramble a bit and reminisce a bit. <coughs> and uh, don't always hit the theme of the conference, but I I'll do my best. As I said, when I spoke last, the Troika were in town, and since then, you know what happened. You remember the main points of it. And uh, we left the Troika and waved them goodbye after three years without any precautionary programs. I think it's generally known as well, we had a lot of uh, nervous people in the cabinet and a lot of nervous people in the wider civil service and in the various state agencies who felt that we shouldn't uh, leave the Troika go without a belt and braces uh, strategy behind. But we got back into the markets clearly without any precautionary program. And yesterday, Irish 10-year bonds were quoted at 0.8 of 1%, uh, four-fifths of, uh, of 1%. So I think it's proof that we got safely back into the markets and stayed there. Uh, the names that were part of the daily dialogue in Ireland at that stage were people like Commissioner Olly Wren, uh, Christine Lagarde, who was the French <coughs> finance minister, now in the IMF and a great friend of Ireland's, uh, Wolfgang Schrobel, who never refused a reasonable request that I put to him. Mario Draghi in the bank, who was always very helpful. Uh, Klaus Regling, who was in charge of uh, the European uh, fund that funded the European money that we got, and uh, was very helpful to me when we went to repay the IMF loans that were outstanding. And Jerome Dieselblum, who was president of the Eurogroup. These were all very important in our lives in Ireland. and. Uh, they may be forgotten names now, but I'd like to note them here today because they were very helpful to us. Uh, people that the Irish public don't realise are so helpful were people like Mark Carney, 
who was head of the Bank of England now, but at that time was head of the Central Bank of Canada. And he was also chairman of uh, an organization of central bankers uh, to bring stability into the monetary markets. It was Mark Carmen Carney who designed the alternative arrangement for the promissory note for me. And I'd like to put my thanks on the record as well, because uh, a lot of other smart people, they failed to crack it. Uh, but Mark uh, gave me uh, the design of it, and we got that agreed across Europe then. And his, his minister, Jim, the late Jim Flaherty, who was a great friend of Ireland as well, the Canadian finance minister. It's not generally known that in the IMF and in the World Bank, we operate in constituencies, groups of countries, and the Irish constituency is led by Canada. And Jim Flaherty was, was very good to Ireland in the IMF and in the World Bank in those times. And of course, we must also recall the great A.J. Chopra, affectionately known as the Chopper by the Irish taxpayers, uh, for his insistence on uh, financial cutbacks. Uh, but he played his part as well and was a friend of Ireland. So you'll forgive me for reminiscing because uh, these were the people that we negotiated with and these are the people who were most helpful to us during the three years that the Troika were here. And that was the three years, uh, as I say, uh, since I spoke last to this institute. Now things have changed utterly, you know. I don't think a terrible beauty has been born yet, but uh, things have changed utterly. The Irish economy now is unrecognisable from how it was in 2011. We're on the third year of the fastest growth in Europe. The next budget should be balancing the budget and showing a slight surplus probably. We're on the cusp of full employment, having come down from over 15% unemployment rates to almost six now. Uh, we have a debt GDP ratio which is below the European average, uh, even though debt is still a risk to us. And uh, the growth is also inclusive, if I could come back to the theme of the conference. Uh, my experience on the ground in politics is the great social division in any country, and particularly in Ireland, is between those who have jobs and those who don't have jobs. And uh, unemployed people have a very hard time. Even though we sustained uh, the headline levels of social welfare during the crisis, to be unemployed is to be on low income. To be unemployed is to be in a poor household. To be unemployed is to have your morale going down and staying down. And uh, after a while, there's a kind of a hopelessness uh, enters in the doors of unemployed households. So if you want an inclusive society, get people back to work. And work is the, is, is the solution to many of the problems of inclusion. And well-paid well work is of great benefit. And uh, we have done that. Now, it's arguable that the initial stages of the recovery uh, were confined to Dublin and the East Coast. Uh, but that has changed, particularly in the last 12 months. The Central Statistics Office divides the Irish economy into 14 sectors. Every one of those sectors, 12 of them private, two of them public, have put on jobs in the last two years. And every region in the country has also put on jobs. So the recovery now is across all sectors and is in all regions. And there's an acknowledgement of that. And that is, I think the biggest contribution to uh, an inclusive society that we can make, and that should continue. Of course, there are other issues. And as I said, we maintained uh, the rate, the headline rates of, of social welfare, but that's safety net politics. Getting people out of poverty, jobs is what you create, and well-paid jobs is what you create. And you organize your economy uh, so that uh, your employment is moving up the skill set so that there's even better pay jobs uh, as you invest in education and as you move towards a modern economy. And uh, we're doing that. And of course there's more to be done. Let's uh, acknowledge that always. I don't think any senior politician would ever say job finished. Uh, but progress, significant progress has been made, as I say, in all sectors, in all regions. And uh, the great 
social division of being unemployed, being jobless, being hopeless, uh, that's being now removed from Irish society. It applies to the young as well. And many of the young people who didn't go into unemployment because they immigrated are now coming back. And the figures are quite interesting. There was a net inflow in March of uh, 2016. Uh, the last figures I've seen, there was a net inflow of 3,000. But it's a long way back to March of 2016. A lot has happened since. So I understand anecdotally that there's a very strong inflow in, in now. So we have to continue to keep doing the good things we're doing. And then we have to look at the micro issues that are uh, affecting inclusiveness in our society and address those as micro issues within the macro policies that we have been following. There are risks. There are always risks. But debt is a big risk in Ireland all the time. And we kind of, our fears are allayed on debt because the way it's measured internationally. It's always measured in debt GDP ratios. And on the jet, debt GDP ratios, we're about 74%, and the European average is somewhere in the low 90s. So it looks very good. But there are other measurements of debt where we don't look good at all. I mean, it's 200 billion per capita debt is 42 for every man, woman, and child in the country. And we're second only to Japan, if you measure it on the basis of per capita debt. So that debt, the risk is out there with that huge bulk of money. If you look at it historically as well, you know, at the top of the Celtic Tiger, and let it be true or false economy, uh, the debt was 25 billion. It's now 200 billion. So you can see by a historic measurement uh, that it has changed dramatically, and it is a risk. And the debt has to be brought down, not just in proportionate terms, but in actual terms. And that's why I, I confirm again that it's a good idea to use the proceeds of the sale of the banks uh, to bring down the debt, because the money that recapitalized them was borrowed anyway in the first instance. And we proceed to do that. It's about the only internal risk though, that we have. The other risks are external. Brexit is a risk, and I don't need to recite the Brexit risks for all of you. Uh, we don't know what the crystallization of the risk will be until the agreement between the UK and the European Union is finalized, if it is finalized. Uh, but we know it's a risk, and it can be a very big risk, or it can be a more moderate risk if uh, Mrs May is still Prime Minister and she succeeds in negotiating a free trade agreement with the European Union which is reciprocated. That modifies the risk for us. But if we have to pay tariffs, it's a huge risk. If we have to pay World Trade Organization tariffs, it's a massive risk. The risk on prime steak, for example, sorry, the tariff on prime steak, for example, is about 60%. The tariffs across a range of dairy products are between 30 and 50%. You can imagine what that does to the competitiveness of the Irish food industry in the UK market. Now, the margins aren't as wide on manufactured goods, but again, they can, they can tip the balance. So Brexit is a risk to our prosperity, and like all the risks that face us, we have to be very smart, both at political level and civil service level and diplomatic level, uh, to negotiate the solutions that are in our best interests. And our best interest at the moment is that the UK would land with an arrangement that's not too far from what they have at the minute. A single market under another name. That's what best suits us. The second risk is uh, Mr. Trump's America, because he has been making very strong protectionist soundings. Now, we're free trade people. We're a small island, less than 5 million people in the 26 counties. We live by trade. We live by trade. And unless we can trade openly, without tariffs or without protectionism, that's a risk, and there's a threat to that coming from the United States administration now. The second risk from the United States has been ameliorated in the last month or so, and that's the, the desire to put in a kind of a customs tax. I mean, if you stick 20% onto all goods imported into the United States, and we're exporting about 17% of everything we produce to the United States, you can see what the impact that may have. 
But the White House has gone cold on that particular issue. They're no longer sponsoring it. And uh, the people in the House who are promoting a customs import tax, I don't believe they have a majority anymore because there has been such domestic opposition to it. So that risk is, is ameliorated significantly. There will be changes in the corporate tax code in the United States. I don't think it will affect us very much. The rates are very high. They're totally out of line with other trading economies. They're somewhere between 35 and 38. They could take 10, 15 percent off them and they wouldn't affect us. Uh, there's a secondary proposal, though, that there would have some kind of amnesty with a levy attached for repatriating profits. There are 2.7 trillion U.S. multinational profits elsewhere in the world. And uh, they, they, are, they are liable to tax, but the tax only crystallizes if the profits are repatriated to the United States. And there's a proposal put forward by Mr. Trump's people that they would repatriate not at the corporate tax rate, but at 10 percent. And uh, it's even more complex than that. Uh, they would be free to use the money as they wished if the profits were deemed to be repatriated. Now, that's a fancy way of saying you have an amnesty if you pay 10 percent and you can do what you like with your capital overseas. Now, that shouldn't affect us very much. As a matter of fact, it may loosen up capital that could be used right around the world, but also in Ireland. So I think the, the threats from the United States have ameliorated somewhat. I don't think there's a very large threat on the corporate tax side, uh, but there is a threat on the protectionism side, and we're not sure how that's going to, how that's going to carry out. We have country-specific recommendations from the Commission, which were brought forth last week as part of the EU semester process. And I think this is a very important process, where you get an external evaluation of your economic policies, and, and you get advice. And usually the advice is pretty sound. So the advice this time is to continue to stabilize the public finances. And the advice is also to use any windfall gains to reduce the debt. Now, apart from the sale of bank shares, we're going to get significant uh, windfall gains from uh, NAMA profits. They announced their annual report yesterday. They're predicting now they'll have in excess of $3 billion to return to the Exchequer uh, when they finish their operation. There are significant windfall gains as well coming from the liquidation of IBRC Anglo. And when that liquidation completes, that's not only sufficient for uh, unsecured creditors, but there is money which will also be transferred to the Exchequer. Uh, there's also a recommendation which would be in line with your, your team today uh, to activate activation policies for unemployed persons, especially with low skills, who find that their skill set don't, don't fit the labour market anymore, uh, retraining and so on. And of course, that's a very good recommendation. And there's also a recommendation on non-performing loans. AIB, which is in the news now, had non-performing loans in excess of 30 billion. Uh, they have it down to about 8 billion now. And uh, all the banks in Europe, in the context of banking union, have been instructed in the last couple of weeks uh, by uh, the European Union banking regulator in Frankfurt to get their non-performing loans down. Uh, and again, it's a recommendation we can agree with. So these recommendations I can agree with, and I'll bequeath them to my successor uh, to implement them uh, as time goes by. On Europe, I suppose, uh, Europe is growing again. I think all economies were growing six months ago. Uh, Greece has had a bit of a setback in the last quarter, but it should start to grow again when, in the next two weeks, uh, the money for the third program is released, as I expect it to be released to them in the second week in June. Uh, so Europe is growing. It's not growing very strongly, but it's growing stronger than it was last year or the year before. And the quantitative easing policy followed by Mario Draghi is working. And uh, it's, uh, you know, monetary policy is working in Europe now. And I hope it continues to work. Uh, Europe has changed as well. The big risks in Europe uh, weren't so much the economy, but the political instability coming from right and left-wing populism. Uh, 
and all that agenda that you know so well about that you follow in the news. Now that has changed. Spain, on, on the replay, uh, succeeded in stabilizing around the center and putting that kind of government in place again. Uh, Austria succeeded in uh, putting a center president in place when there was a, a threat of fascism again in Austria. Uh, Holland uh, succeeded in keeping uh, the anti-immigrant party to about 10 percent and are in the process of forming a government now around the centre and I think that will be completed in the first half of June. Uh, France, uh, Macron is centrist and that has happened as well. And if you cross across all of them, apart from they being centrist in terms of economics and ideology, they're all pro-European. So there's a series of pro-European governments now being formed across Europe. And if you were looking at it this time last year, you'd be saying Europe is in crisis. But it's no longer in crisis now because there's a stabilization around the centre. Mrs. Merkel is favoured to win in Germany. She has won very significant regional elections. I suppose the most significant North Line Westphalia. Population of 18 million people. And uh, she changed the arithmetic by 8%. And, uh, you know, very significant. And always treated, that, that regional election is always treated as a weather vane for the national elections of Poland because it's the last big one before the national election. So if one was to predict the future, you would see a reaffirmation of the French-German axis. Uh, you see Berlin and Paris coming closer. And uh, that would be good for Europe, for those of us who believe in the European project. We, we, we'd like to, to see that. There are problems, of course, that continue in Europe. Uh, one of them is, can you have a, a currency union without a monetary union? Quite clearly, no. So there is a monetary union in Europe, and it's run by the European Central Bank. But the more interesting question is, can you have a currency union without a fiscal union? And there are fiscal rules that are common, uh, which we apply in common, and I referred already to the European semester and the recommendations <coughs> from the Commission, which are part of that. Uh, but there are other issues as well that are emerging now from Macron's government. Uh, is it possible to have a budget for the Eurozone? to be deployed across the Eurozone? Is it possible to have mutualization of debt in the Eurozone? And uh, would that ultimately lead uh, to a European Eurozone uh, finance minister who would deploy the budget and make budgetary decisions? And uh, Emmanuel Macron is very much in favor of, of these concepts. Uh, so they're going to become part of the European agenda in the next couple of months and uh, there'll be a significant debate on them, and you, you can see the difficulties. If you look at other currency unions, like the United States, you know, Alexander Hamilton started this out back around 1795, and they mutualized debt in the United States, and uh, they underpinned the dollar, and the question you know, hasn't really arisen since. Uh, but you're into the debate, I mean, what does mutualization of debt mean in practice? Well, it means that some central authority issues euro bonds, and the risk on debt issued is shared across uh, the members who are in the euro. So there's an interesting debate about to emerge, and uh, we'll see where it lands. One of the things that concerns me is that I was involved in the campaign. I'm, I'm old enough <coughs> to have been involved in the campaign on Ireland's entry to the European Union way back in the early 70s. And at the time, part of the argument was that the Commission was the bulwark for the interests of smaller countries, and that we wouldn't be overwhelmed by the larger economies, the French and the Germans and the Spanish and the Italians, because the Commission had a mandate to stand by smaller countries. That's no longer true. The Commission doesn't stand by smaller countries any longer. As far as I see now, in its modern manifestation, the Commission promotes the interests of the larger countries. You'll see that in the CCCTP, especially not in the consolidation phase, but in the payment phase. Because rather than following the uh, OECD mandate of tax liability arising, where the economic activity which creates the profit occurs, uh, the Commission is trying to apply a formula 
where different pieces of the economic chain will carry an element of the tax. Uh, in other words, that if you sell an awful lot of stuff manufactured in Dublin, if you sell it in France, as well as getting VAT on it, uh, the French exchequer will take a tranche of the profits on it. Uh, so you're applying a formula to different pieces on the chain. And you can see that that obviously uh, disfavors smaller economies who produce, and it favors larger economies who have a big market. And the Commission, uh, through Commissioner Moscovici, is pushing this quite strongly. So I'd be reluctant to rush into new arrangements on fiscal union uh, with a uh, European uh, finance minister unless we had assurances that the Commission would revert to its previous uh, practice, if not mandate, of standing by smaller countries and protecting their interests uh, rather than the larger countries. But What's happening in Europe now is extremely interesting. What's happening in France is very interesting. What's happening in the French-German relationships is very interesting. As late as yesterday, I heard that uh, some of Mr. Macron's advisors uh, have developed a policy to encourage extra investment in Europe and to modify the fiscal rules to allow for investment. And this is something we can support as well because it's necessary. Uh, investment right across the, the Eurozone now, uh, even though it has increased with the Juncker plan, it's 2% less than the average between 2000 and 2005. So we're still adrift of what it was uh, just at the turn of the century. And the extra investment is required. If you want to grow economies, you know, especially when they're recovering from recession, you have to invest. And if the fiscal rules are one size fits all, and they restrict the capacity to invest in both social and economic infrastructure. That's to the detriment of growth in the economy. And you can invest without doing any violence to uh, the general scheme of macroeconomic <coughs> management or indeed uh, without any undue risk uh, to uh, the fiscal position of countries. So that's really all I wanted to say, and I wanted to put it in that context. I mean, I agree with the theme of the conference. There's not much point in having kind of statistical growth in the economy. <coughs> There's no point in having growth in the economy that doesn't permeate the lives of people. There's no point in having growth in the economy that simply continues to enrich an elite. Growth in the economy always has to uh, be for the generality of people. And I suppose growth like uh, without inclusivity is it's like prayer without good works, Father Sean. Isn't that the way, that the way you'd say it at the altar? <laughs> so thank you very much.